Hello and welcome everyone to, to Diversity uh, Top of Leading with, with, with Purpose, the, the latest installment in our Black Black Leadership and Ambition Collective Knowledge and, and, and Success Career Conversation Series in, in partnership with Black Mentorship Inc., uh, Sheridan's Co um, Career, Career Integrated Learning Services and Sheridan Alumni. My name is Tristan Pennock, and I'm a current Sheridan Sheridan student in the, in the Honors Bachelor of uh, Community Safe, Safe, Safety Program. And I'm also a student leader by, 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 by way of peer, peer mentoring, student uh, uh, leadership coaching, and, and, the, and the Vice, Vice Pres 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 President of Academics and, and Equity. Uh, hi, my name is Sierra Johnson, and I am a current Sheridan College student in the Bachelor of Business Marketing Management Program. And I am also a student leader, as in the peer mentor and the leadership coach as well. So I want to say thank you for joining us today. As we gather virtually, we want to thank, like to thank, uh, acknowledge that all the Sheridan campuses reside on the land that have been and still is the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederation, the Wandi the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Since time immemorial, numerous Indigenous nations and Indigenous people have lived, up, lived in and passed through this territory. We recognize this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Two Row Wanpu Treaty, which emphasizes the importance of joint stewardship, peace, and respect, respectful relationships. Joining us from different territories, we acknowledge the many diverse nations and territories you are joining from. Sheridan College affirms it is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here and those who have yet to come. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn, working, living and thriving on this land. Oh, Tristan, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Uh, tonight, what I was saying is tonight you will be hearing from from six six successful Sheridan alumni who are not only leaders within their com com uh, within their industry, but also leaders within their com community. The, the the panel will will offer insights on on how to how to how to lead with purpose in order to to help make a better works workspace for for tomorrow's leaders. I was reading an article in Forbes the other day, and the one of the statements really resonated with me. Race not only still matters in the workplace, but it remains a powerful barrier that prevents African Americans from exceeding in leadership. As tomorrow's leaders, I feel it's important that we learn how we can lead with purpose and pivot towards a new norm. I couldn't agree with you more, Sierra. I look forward to, to these events throughout throughout the year as, as we continue to, to create safe safe spaces where, where diverse ex ex experiences are welcome, valued, and respected. Our, our, our moderator for, for tonight is Evangeline Chima, the, the founder of Black Black Mentorship Inc. or BMI, an organization dedicated to, to fostering for professional growth and, and personal ex ex expansion of Black professionals through education, mentorship, and, and, sk and skill building. BMI was born out of, out of her own pers pers personal experience with sy 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 systematic race racism and a, a bias towards a, a Black pro professional woman. From those, ex from, from those experiences, Evangel Evangel Evangeline was able to get the rec rec recognition from Black Black pro pro professionals and and understand that they are they are un under represented across indus industries and in leadership roles. Ev Evangeline cre created B BMI to, to inspire, su su support, and mentor Black pro professionals to to fulfill their 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 potential build community and promote change. Evangeline has also provided invaluable mentorship to Sheridan students, as well as consult to Sheridan execs and academic leadership teams. She has been named one of the black women to watch and is also nominated for the Woman of Inspiration Award. 
Her dream is to see every Black professional propel and reach their full potential. Join me in welcoming Evangeline Chima. Welcome, Evangeline. Thank you so much, Syria. Thank you, Tristan, for that beautiful introduction. You guys rock. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am truly delighted to be moderating the fourth session of the Black Mentorship Inc. and Sheridan's Black Career Conversation Series. Our team today is diversity at the top, leading with purpose. So before we begin, let me start with housekeeping. Please, if you have any questions, type in your questions in the chat or I believe there is a QA box somewhere. Our student leaders, you just met them, Trista and Sira, will be paying attention to your questions. And when we finish the panel discussions, they will read your questions out to our panelists. If we don't get to your questions, I ask not to, you, for you not to worry. We will send your questions to our panels and get back to you with responses. So right now, I have the honor to present our outstanding panelists. Hello, panelists. Hello. Hi. In no particular order, uh, starting with you, Faith, if I may, uh, two minutes to say hello, introduce yourself, and tell us briefly why leading with a purpose, you know, what does that mean to you, leading with a purpose? Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and I'm very excited to be here. And, um, you know, thank you for this time and, and, and this, um, I guess, opportunity. Um, uh, my background is in HR. I, I am a proud Sheridan grad uh, in business administration and marketing. And I worked in, you know, business for a while, and then I specialized in HR and over the last 30 years have basically worked in a, in a number of industries as well as, um, you know, moved up the ranks in HR to, uh, you know, the top leadership roles globally. Uh, in terms of leading with purpose, you know, I do see it somewhat, um, I like to tell stories and I like movies and I see it in correlation to somewhat of a director in, in, in a movie, right? The script is already written um, but from a leadership perspective, you have to create meaning, you have to create purpose, and you have to let it resonate with your team. So therefore, finding those gems and those moments where you understand what's important to your individual team members and tie that back into the strategy and the scope of the role that's already been written and just make it real and allow them to, to do their thing and, and make it real and to learn and to grow. So. Uh, leading with purpose for me is is really tying everything back in, answering the why we're here, what are we doing, and what's the purpose? How are we going to get there? Um, getting out of their way and then allowing them to to be their great selves. So um, that's that's what it means to me. Thank you so much. I love that. You know, finding the purpose. I'm coming to you, Tanya. I introduce yourself and talk to us. Why? What 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 does leading with purpose mean to you? Sure. So um, I'm Tanya Sinclair. Uh, this year marks my 20th anniversary in human resources. So I've been in the game not quite as long as Faith, but uh, getting getting close to that period of time. Um, I'm a proud Sheridan alumna. Uh, in 2004, I graduated from the human resources program and uh, really happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. In terms of my background, um, I was born in Jamaica and then came over to Canada and have spent most of my time in Alberta and then over uh, moved over to Toronto in the last half of my life and have spent most of my time working in um, municipal sector, not-for-profit sector, as well as some private sector as well, primarily in HR. Thank you, Tanya. Oh, wow. You and Faith both from HR. So, we covered today. We're good. <laughs> okay. Last but not the least, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Yes, my name is Ryan Knight, uh, one of the co-executive directors of the Afro-Caribbean Business Network, also an entrepreneur myself. I run a company called Detail Ignites. And so when we talk about diversity at the top, I always come from the lens of 
skipping the line. So becoming an entrepreneur, placing yourself at the top and then hiring when you're hiring and you already have diversity in your heart, we don't need to do a lot of D and I training. We don't have to really beg other companies to improve their anti-black racism. Uh, what did you even call it? Protocols, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big proponent of starting our own businesses, increasing that percentage of black ownership, and then yeah, hiring with diversity at heart. So it's not an issue. Absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned starting our own business. So really, truly, we need to start somewhere. Uh, you know, uh, today's conversation, as you guys have touched, it's all about diversity at the top, leading with purpose, starting your own business uh, and, and what have you. So to me, to become a leader, you have to start somewhere. All right. So Tanya, I'm going to come to you with this question, you know, strictly from a career development perspective. Um, how might developing leadership experience enhance a, a job seeker's marketability uh, or even help them gain clarity in their career? I mean, leadership really is, is at the heart of everything in, in business, in any type of um, work situation. So um, I think being able to hone your leadership skills in any way you can as a student, um, whether that be through showing leadership in your own institutions, in your community, in your workplaces, but any way that you can sort of um, show that you've gone above and beyond or you took initiative to lead others um, or to coordinate things, all of those things I think really are helpful and it helps to build your portfolio so that you can get into other spaces and and uh, make an even bigger impact. Hmm. That's that's interesting. Um, I'm going to come to you with this question, Ryan. Similar in the same team started. Uh, if students are interested in taking on leadership roles in the future, um, what can they do now to build that necessary skills? Um, gain the necessary experience. Uh, I mean, Tanya just mentioned, you, you know, they, they should try and you know showcase what any any way that they can get the leadership skills you know build their portfolio so the question here is how can they gain that necessary experience as students to build their personal and professional brand yeah and i mean we can really become subject in a lot of things that are new like trends are happening, especially in technology, where if you watch one, two YouTube videos, you now are in like the 1%, especially like cybersecurity is something that if you just decided to learn it now, you would be ahead of the curve with everybody else that's coming behind you. So when you're in a position where you're working, let's say you're volunteering somewhere, a lot of times I see youth come into our organization and they want to skip the line. They're like, okay, I'm coming in with X amount of expertise and I want to lead this. But what they what they miss is that a true leader first learns to follow. And when you get good at learning from like leaders that are there to mentor you, then you learn how to lead. So don't like my advice would be don't try to skip the line. Don't feel like you have to lead right away. Take that time to absorb from good leader. Find a good leader to follow and then be a person that can now lead others. And that's where even in business, like with management, when you're hiring somebody and promoting them into management, you're typically promoting somebody that's an expert at their craft. So be the best at following and really learning your craft and then emerge into leadership and really take that on. So I would say just don't try to skip the line. I like that. Don't try to skip the line. There is no need to rush, right? Take your time, learn the trade. Um, true leaders, they, they, they learn to follow. So all of those are great points. Uh, we lost Faith. So uh, why would we to see if she would come back? <laughs> uh, Tanya, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think... Um just in regards to what you were saying about don't skip the line, I, I don't know, I kind of have, I was listening to you, Ryan, and I, I hear you, but there's also a, a part of me when I see candidates come in that have that zest and they're, they, they have that go for it attitude. I think that also to a certain extent is appealing. Um, 
you know, if they if they're willing to sort of learn and and do some following, I, I don't mind when people want to reach a little higher as long as they know that it takes some work to get there, right? It's not just going to be handed to you. Yes, yes. But I, I don't mind the mindset of of sort of yeah. I'm here to to do my thing, <laughs> you know. But that's where I love that like um, fortitude. But then a lot of times they'll be trying to like to edge the CEO out of his seat. And it's like, easy, you know, like I, yeah. I, I appreciate you wanting to be at the front and leading the charge, but the company that you're within, the vision isn't yours. So you have to really learn what this culture is now that you have been accepted into. And hey, at some point you're gonna get that chance. So showing that you're ready, you're probably gonna get the chance quicker than a person that comes in and tries to, you know, be more passive and not really want to take on more opportunities. So if you show that you're ready to take on a leadership role, there's gonna be many opportunities. A CEO loves, loves when a new potential leader comes in, but it's not to lead everything, it's to lead specific projects. So that's where I would say, yeah. Don't, I think both of you have the great points. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think both of you have great points. Uh, and I love what you said, Tanya. You know, there is absolutely nothing wrong with somebody dreaming big and wanting yeah. to, if they can, fly without crawling. But, you know, you're also saying they have to realize that there is a lot of work to do for them to get there. And Ryan is also saying, hey, guys, you know, uh, it's okay. You know, if you can, if you want to lend a train and then who knows, you fly afterwards, you know. So, oh, we still don't have faith. Uh, and so I'm going to move on to the next um, team that we have today. And I'm looking at, you know, uh, I'm of the view that personal and professional development, they both go together, right? So um, do you have a defining moment in your personal or professional life that solidified your leadership aspirations? Tanya. Hmm, defining moment. I think a defining moment for me um, probably was when I decided to found Black Human Resources Professionals of Canada um, because I was really following um, my heart, my passion. And it's a beautiful thing, right? When you when you are doing something that you're truly passionate about um, and not just, you know, just working for others, but actually doing something for your community. I would say that... Um, was certainly something that I felt made me feel that this is work with a lot of meaning, uh, mm -hmm. founding that organization and um, really just being able to connect with amazing other professionals who are in my field and hearing their stories and their journeys and feeling part of a network of other individuals who are like-minded, um, but still growing in different ways. I think all of that has helped me sort of take my leadership in my career to the next level without me even um, realizing it. So I think doing something for myself, um, for me, it is something that I do on the side, um, but it's a beautiful thing. And I feel very, very good to sort of find some way to, to give back. It's, it's a great thing. Isn't it amazing how when you are looking for ways to give back, you end up also giving to yourself. True. So right. true. Yeah, so Ryan, Sheridan Students Leadership Framework, um, I'm sure you know all about this, is centered around personal growth, making a difference and um, working together, right? So what is your personal framework or mission as a leader? Oh. I muted and then I muted and then I unmuted. <laughs> so, um, personal mission. I remember when I was at Sheridan and while I was starting detailing nights at the tail end of the school, I guess graduate started running a college pro painters franchise at the same time because I realized I didn't know what I was doing trying to run my business. So I figured, let me go find some help. And after going through that experience, when I came back to my company, I realized that being able to train 
more potential leaders going into the community and finding people that didn't realize they had the potential to start their own business. I felt like if somebody had shown me the path to entrepreneurship while I was in high school, I would have I would be so much further ahead. So my personal, I guess, I know stance is everybody should try entrepreneurship at least once because door to door and talking to customers and having doors slammed in your face and people not interested. That's what put hair. That's what puts hair on your chest. And again, I know ladies, if you don't need the hair, the battle testedness, <laughs> it still makes you battle tested for the real world. And that's where when you're put in those positions as a leader, I feel like I've heard every single leader that's done keynotes and what have you written books. They all talk about persistence, perseverance, mm. not giving mm. up and talking mm -hmm. to clients that don't want what you have and being okay with that to go to the next person that might want it is a big skill that I feel might be in short or short supply as the new generation is coming through, at least from what I'm seeing that persistence I'm hoping is not going to die out. And I hope so too. And I hear mm -hmm. you recently, I had this phase, you know, finding the opportunity in the obstacle. Uh, and honestly, since I had that, I don't know how many times I've repeated that to myself, because the truth is when those doors are closed to your face, right? You just need to think, of, look at it as a detour and find the opportunity in that closed door, not always only in the open door. So hi, Faith, welcome back. Hi, thank you. Maybe you should just ask me everything right now. <laughs> now I'm going to pile all the questions on you. <laughs> I'm kidding. Nice to have you back, you know, and I really would like to get you to weigh in on uh, getting started. You know, that's one team that we discussed while you were away. So do us a favor, please. Uh, can you speak to your lead experience as a Black person? And uh, let us know how that has informed the career path and leadership decisions you've made. Okay. So um, like Tanya, I was born in Jamaica and I came to Canada when I was almost 10 years old, a single mother, four daughters living in government housing. And, mm -hmm. you know, really there's always a stereotype that goes with that. There's you know, barriers and negative expectations, you know, so the goal for us was really to, um, you know, break out of that and to be resilient and to um, endure through hardships and, you know, not getting encouragement, you know, from our, um, you know, our instructors, our leaders, our teachers, you know, there was racism, you know, in the, the mid to late 70s that we faced being, you know, the one of the only in, in a classroom of 30, for instance. So, you know, it's having that um, resilience to, to make it through that, um, as well as, you know, the fact that nothing came easy. You know, we weren't born with silver spoons. Um, so finding a way to make it work and, and really just taking a back seat and watching and learning and listening to see what worked and, um, and then just going for it. You know, even when you didn't have belief or faith in yourself, um, having some sort of, you know, leader, which was my mother, you know, who believed in us and, 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 and showed us that, you know, hard work, dedication and grind um, really helped. So I think that was pivotal for me. And I do use that in my leadership. I, you know, I, I do want, you know, folks to understand that um, everybody started somewhere. And at the end of the day, we're all a team. And, you know, if we put our heads down and, you know, kind of join, um, you know, with the same type of focus and dedication, uh, you know, we can we can get through anything. So, you know, I, we had, you know, a lot against us, you know, as people of color and not really seeing ourselves represented in, in the corporate world, but really trying to be a role model and um, just being open to everybody and everyone's, um, you know, growth and development and knowing that it could all be taken away any, any time. But at the end of the day, we know that we could, you know, come, come um, rise above it again. Hmm. Thank you for sharing. Really. Uh, I can't even imagine what it must have been for you, <laughs> you know, during those times, because till today, um, I remember when I first started in the IT field, I was basically the only black female. So yeah. 
and this was late 90s so I, I can only but imagine so thank you for holding strong uh for for all of us yeah uh ryan uh you know we're gonna shift a little bit here um to be an impactful leader you have to first take care of yourself before you can take care of others right that's what we all think believe um, but yet the uptake of social media, the craziness of it, you know, trying to keep up is making this difficult. Do you feel that social networking has impacted how we do things in leadership? Uh, it's definitely tried to turn people into hustlers where mm. a lot of, and I use Instagram, a lot of go for it like these five tips to change your lifestyle and work from the beach and all these like uh i don't call it show offiness but it's like they just paint a picture especially for entrepreneurs and people living the best everybody has the perfect job and then you don't really see behind the scenes what it really took to get there so a lot of people are seeing what's happening on instagram and then buying courses that will teach them how to become uh, a beach millionaire. And then mm. that is not the true path. So it's hard to compete with social media because it is so sexy. It, it looks so great. They post three times a day and you get bombarded with all this positivity, but then they're skipping the hard work. So I'm, I'm curious how we could use social media to actually show hard work. And I mean, I'm no expert in that. And then you started off talking about self-care and I'm definitely no expert in that. I bet Tanya and Faith uh, take better care of themselves than I do. Even next week, I was saying to myself, okay, you know what? I'm going to try and take next week, not off, but slower. But then important meetings just, it's like, oh, are you busy next week? I know we could been missing each other. Let's meet. I was like, okay, yeah, I can just fit you in. It's so difficult to just turn it off. So yeah, and social media backs you up. It's like never turn it off. It just tells you to keep going. So, yeah, I might I might need to. I don't know if Faith or Tanya has a course that they're teaching how to slow down. I know Faith was saying she's semi retired. What does that look like, Faith? How does? Well, we can talk <laughs> offline. <laughs> you know what? Well, go ahead and talk to us, Faith or Tanya. Chip in on this. Let us know. <laughs> really? You know, I I I believe that the work is always going to be there and. Knowing the brief, you know, briefly what I know about you, you're you're working more than 100 percent and you're always given 100 percent and it, it's just never going to go away. So it's, you know, either being comforted if you, you're an entrepreneur. So I know you might not have a big team to rely on. It's probably you doing everything, um, you know, but you have to you have to be good to yourself and you have to be healthy in order to be a healthy leader and a successful. So. Oh, and I've only learned this in the last several years, right? I'm in my 50s now, and it took me a very long time to just do that self-care and take time for me. Um, so it, it's a discipline, and you have to love yourself more than you love anything or anybody else to right. treat yourself because you do deserve it, and the work is still going to be there, right? The more you do, the more you're going to be asked to do. So I really just try to prioritize and to stay healthy um, for your yourself, your family, and your your team and your business. So it, it's just a mindset and you just really have to be disciplined around it. And and I I, I really forced myself to do that. It, it was hard because as you're climbing, you know, there's competition, right? For, so for me, there was, you know, younger competition. There's the Tanya's of the world coming up and there's the Ryan's and, you know, I'm like, I'm in it, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, I think, you know, I, I got to a point in my career where I'm grateful that I'm able to take a step back and leave the big corporate roles to focus on volunteering my time, but while still being in the game with the consulting that I'm doing. So I'm grateful I'm in that position, um, but you can get there with the right amount of dedication and purposeful and intentional um, taking care of yourself. You're just going to have to do it. Hmm. Thank so you true. so much for that. Tanya, I can see you. you You want to jump in. Let me also add a question for you that, you know, so uprising of mental health, uh, you know, the impact and all of that. Do you think that has influenced your decision making as a leader? Oh, absolutely. I 
when I think back um, particularly to sort of a um, sort of a life changing moment that I had with um, a close friend of mine whose son um, started to display um, behaviors that at the time we thought were related to drug use, but it wasn't drugs. It was actually a mental health condition. And, you know, I, I didn't really know much about mental health back in 2013, which was not that long ago. Um, but what it did is it really taught me when I started to realize the statistics that one in five people do um, at some point in their life are going to have some sort of mental health challenge. So it forced me to really rethink, what about my workplace? What about the people that I have reporting into me? What about what programs am I putting in place in my workplace to help make um, the workplace a safe space um, and a place that people can feel that they, they can be themselves at work? And so it was really through realizing some of the stigmas that I had and did not fully understand that I really found, we talked a bit about being um, filled with purpose. And I found I really, really started to think all of my leadership decisions, I would sort of say to myself, okay, how might that impact staff? Um, we know that it impacts numbers. How might that impact individuals? How might that impact teams? And I wasn't, I can't say I was really doing that before and being very intentional about have we worked in a component that might um, take care of some of the needs that this change that I'm introducing or that leadership is introducing how is that good? How are individuals going to cope with that change? And have we given them some supports to help them through it? Um, so I think it's made me more intentional and more mindful um, of the challenges that many, many people are dealing with. And some you will never know what they're really mm -hmm. dealing with. You may only just see some behaviors that you're not sure about, um, but there could be more to it. So I think as leaders, our role is to take the time to um, try to be mindful, try to provide supports to help people through difficult times, give them the right resources that they can get through those difficult times, um, and, and support them in the good times too. So I think it's made me, the uprising of mental health has just made me more intentional and more mindful. Hmm. Thank you. I'm actually also thinking, um, you know, most of our audience today are students. So you all have talked about, you know, as leaders, what you need to do um, to help with mental health. Um, if you all can be very specific, like give me specific steps as students, as you know, students, their stress level is usually over the top. Um, there is that peer pressure, right? Um, there is sometimes parents like me, um, you know, setting this expectation so high. Give me specific steps. The students listening to us here today, how can they help manage their stress level and obviously their mental health? I can Anything? start if you like. Um, I think in terms of steps, it's not dissimilar, I think, to what I've sort of learned from a workplace perspective, from a workplace mental health perspective, which is you will be a better you when you take care of you. So you will be a better student, you will be a better friend, you will be a better worker if you take some time to take care of you. Now, it doesn't have to be big, huge amounts of time and tropical vacations. Sometimes it literally is actually taking lunch, right? Like actually putting food in your body. Mm. Um, sometimes it might just be getting fresh air, opening up a window, right? And mm. and just letting some, sun, some sunshine hit you and, and hearing some air and then taking a deep breath oh okay mm -hmm. i got this maybe it's taking mm -hmm. the time to make a phone call to call that friend who's actually a good supporter mm -hmm. and just giving yourself a five minute mental break from this problem that maybe you find is all encompassing so it doesn't have to always be huge things you don't necessarily have to join a gym you don't necessarily have to pay a bunch of money but there's small things sometimes that i think you can do to take care of you to help you get through that moment in time. And I think take it in stages. You don't have to be everything to everybody all the time. Maybe you just have to be the best you that you can be in the moment today. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Take it in stages. I love that. Anybody want to chip in before we move to the next one? 
I would agree with that as well. I have a, a 22 year old daughter who just recently graduated from university. So all, you know, the pressures and the stress of doing well and, you know, trying to get into that, you know, post uh, grad programs, um, it's overwhelming. And, mm -hmm. you know, what I find is, you know, like Tanya said, is, is like talking about it and talking to somebody and, you know, at the end of the day, even looking to a professional, and what I've noticed is that things are now normalized. So normalize it in your conversation. I'm having a really bad day. I'm not feeling well. Um, I'm having negative thoughts. And, and just normalize opening up the discussion and opening up the conversation and trying to find ways to make yourself calm down and, you know, breathing, um, whether it's exercising, yoga, walking, just stepping away from it. Um, normalize, you know, talking about not feeling well and finding the support to help you get through it. Because, you know, I, I, I lectured as well. So I know the deadlines and the pressure. Oh, together, feeling stress. And at the end of the day, we're going to have to make it through somehow. And the way you make it through is to find a way to make yourself feel better. Uh, mm -hmm. Because there is, um, it's very destructive to just live in your head um, alone, sharing some of those negative thoughts. So normalize being open and sharing, and you'll see how much love and support you'll get when you say, Hey, I'm not feeling well today because chances are the person beside you isn't either. So, um, normalizing that. I like yeah, that. Yeah. That kind of piggybacked what Tanya was saying, where have a person to call just to talk for five minutes. And even like, I always think of be the support that you want. So if you reach out to somebody and say, hey, having somebody just to talk to that they might need to talk to somebody, you're actually getting that yourself. So listen to like listen to your friends. A lot of times friends of mine will notice when I'm off and they'll know it's like, hey, man, I see you're stressed out or I see you're kind of tart in that meeting. Be willing to listen when people are reaching out and saying like, hey, do you want to talk or but I find we typically ask the wrong questions. A lot of times you say, oh, how are you feeling? It's like, don't, don't ask me how I'm feeling. Like, oh, how's it going? It's like, those are such surface level questions. If we really learn, and again, I don't know like the best questions to ask. I'm just saying, I know, try and ask better questions, but learning how to ask better questions around finding out what a person's really going through, I think would help us identify like when a person is stressed out and not just keeping those conversations at the surface level. How was your day? Good. And then you kind of go off. So, Absolutely. Having a cabinet uh, full of people that you trust that can tell you the yeah. truth, right? Not everybody, people that you can call and you people you can say to, I I I'm not feeling well, you know, straight up without sugarcoating it is really important. I'm going to take a sharp turn for us to discuss barriers, okay? Um, Tanya, I'm gonna come to you. Uh, as you know, overcoming barriers of millions of black professionals, all of us here been through one setback or the other. So in your experience, what do you feel is the biggest barrier for black identifying students you know, who wants to take on leadership positions or roles? There's two things that come to mind, um, experience and representation. I think a lot of, one of the biggest roadblocks that some of um, the students that I've talked to face is I don't have enough experience, but how can I get the experience when no one's giving me an opportunity? So I, I do think that that's a common um, barrier that I hear from students. Um, and I think another one really is, is the representation side in particular for, for, for Black students because it's very hard to be what you can't see. Not mm. impossible, but it's a little harder. And I think when um, students see uh, Black community members in varying professions, um, entrepreneurs, business owners, CEOs, directors, and in all different types of professions and in leadership roles, then it's inspiring and you can see, oh, maybe I can do that. And 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 so I think representation is is a barrier because very often in the work settings they may be going into, they don't see that. Mm, mm. 
Mm, that's a that's a really good one, and, and it's also the other way around too, because because people that look like us are not in that position, it is difficult for the person hiring you to be able to say you can do this because at least they know Tanya Faye Ryan has done it, so it's okay to give Evangeline the opportunity because she can do it. So I I, I hear you on that, uh, Ryan. Uh, what was the roadblock uh, you, you encountered, especially with Afro -Car Canadian or Caribbean business network? Ah, that's a good question. Roadblock. You know, a lot of it was self-imposed. Where the nonprofit world is an interesting space, and there's a lot of entities and organizations in it <laughs> that. I've been in it for a long time. So when you enter and you have new ideas and you're like, hey, I'm thinking of doing X, Y, Z, the reception wasn't as embracing as I thought it would be. It's more like, okay, that's nice to hear, but kind of, you know, go do your thing. So you, I felt like there wasn't a lot of mentorship and shout out to BMI that it's so important to give that type of mentorship, not just in careers, but as leaders, who do we turn to to say, I'm new to leading a nonprofit. I need some assistance. Can you guide me and just be there when I have questions? So not finding those um, mentors and being able to really trial and error a lot of things. I feel like timeframes could have been collapsed if I found mentors in this space a lot earlier. I know for my business, the first time I got like a true genuine mentor it exponentially grew my business and not just the business financially, but my own perception of what I was capable of. I remember that first meeting he was talking about, have you called the president of the supply company that you're getting stuff from? And I'm thinking, who am I to call another business and talk to the president? Like these things, you feel like you're just small in this world, but when you're a business owner or when you're a certain, when you have a certain job, you are at that, but you have to accept the level that you're in. And a lot of times I feel like, I know I have a lot of imposter syndrome. There'll be panels. I'm sitting on this panel and I'm like, what am I doing sitting beside Faith and uh, Tanya where you guys have been running things for like 15 plus years. And so you'll be on different panels. And a lot of times people look at it and ask, my, ask me it's like, oh, why are you sitting on that panel with like a national company? And it took a while to get used to know, like getting used to knowing that I have something of value to say. And the people in the audience actually are privileged to have me on this panel. Like I, it, it took me a long time to get there. So that was a big barrier for myself. That's awesome. That's really affirmation. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm learning to do all the time, reminding yeah. myself I'm, I'm where I am because I'm supposed to be where I am. I work <laughs> hard for it, you know. So quickly, I'm going to ask you a question, Faith. And this is actually leading, you know, the topic is leading within a community. Um, so let me know, let us know, in your own opinion, what does it mean to be a leader in the Black community? Um, you know, it's interesting because I thought about this question and I think I would love for us to get to a day where it's just, what does it mean to be a leader, period? However, you know, in the state that we are in, it's really important for us to see ourselves represented. Um, so for me, it, it really is to be that person that I've never seen before, you know, um, where, um, you know, Tanya and Ryan were talking about you know, not having the, the mentors, um, not having the networks. And, you know, the other thing that I would say is, you know, not having the sponsorship. So for me is I, I try to open doors to all, you know, BIPOC communities. I try to encourage, I try to say yes, you know, to things like this so that we can encourage the next generation um, and, and really be that role model and, and being open to networking and sharing. I do a lot of, you know, virtual coffees. I, I, I meet young folks and really just try to, to help and mentor them and bring them along. And um, for me, it really is all about being a courageous leader, um, you know, asking the tough questions, recognizing the elephant in the room and really showing, you know, that you know your stuff and you belong. And, 
you know, shaking off the imposter syndrome, Ryan, we all have it. We all have it, but it really is just reminding ourselves and doing those positive affirmations to know that we belong here right now. Um, but being that leader is, is really about, you know, bringing others along and, 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 you know, being that mentor and sponsor for others and remembering that, you know, we had it hard, so we don't have to make it hard for others. You know, let's just make it, you know, there, there's a lot of great people in this world and opportunities for everybody to be great. So, you know, let's, let's bring everybody along with us. And I just think and things will work out a lot better. Are we able to just explain quickly the difference between us? Yeah. Do you want me? Do you want me to take a stab at it? Yeah. 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 So, so a mentor really can help you, you know, remove some of the bottlenecks and help you with specific things, right? You know, you 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 have questions about certain processes and how to do things, and that they're experienced individuals who can help to bring you along. Um, and in my mind, a sponsor is a little bit different in the sense that they can do that, but they're the ones who's going to put your name on the table. You know, mm. they're the ones that are in the boardrooms and in the executive room. And they're going to say, you know what? I know a really good person who can do that job. So they're going to look out for you and be your sponsor and 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 and, and help you um, get your name on the tips of the tongues of the decision makers and sort of pave the way for you. The mentor is really trying to help and coach and develop. But the sponsor is really trying to drive your career and, and get you out there. So, mm. you know, that, that's how I distinguish it. Awesome. Yeah, so we have our student leader here. We have a few questions from the audience. So Sarah and Tristan, go ahead. Thank you, Faith, for that. Pleasure. Thank you, Faith. Yes, the, um, there's there's been a lot of great, great conversation. Um, but one of the questions we've been wanting to, to ask is, uh, what are some key, key traits and values that build an inclusive leader? Well, I'll start out. Um, I think when I think about inclusive leaders, they make sure that everybody has a voice. I, I think that's a really keen sign, uh, an important sign of an inclusive leader is somebody who it's not just your voice, but you actually seek out input from others at the table um, and actually valuing it. So I think that would be one one piece that um, I definitely see in leaders who tend to be more inclusive. They also um, tend to be very intentional in um, disrupting and speaking up against bad behaviors, quite honestly, and, and saying, you know, what did you mean when you when you told Jane that blah, 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 and actually confronting it is another sign of an inclusive leader. So those are two things that popped in my mind. Would you uh, just to kind of tag, tag off of that, would you also include self self awareness in that? Oh, for sure. But self awareness is such a funny thing, because people always think that they're oh. self aware. <laughs> Right. So it's something you sort of have to continually work on. And the way you work on it is actually by seeking out feedback from others and actually listening to others, because we how we see ourselves and how others may see ourselves sometimes is a little different. So self-awareness, you actually have to ask people for feedback. That That is very, true, very true. Um, I, I brought that up because I was just kind of pondering, pondering back to the conversation you and Ryan had in regards to skip skipping the line and, and don't skip skipping the line and I, it, it does kind of tie into how self self where are you are you are you as a person because you are kind of treading that line of i am the the, the new person taking on somebody else's vision or am i the eager person that is willing to learn and grow within a company so you're always in a, a kind of a very odd cross crossroads there so thank you thank you for thank you for that Tanya. So true. I love that conversation at the beginning. It was a really a good teeter totter of different perspectives. I, I, I really like that. Thank you guys. So I, I have a question for Ryan. So you are the executive director of the Afro Caribbean Business Network. So why is this business network important to you and for black business owners? Yeah, uh, actually in the chat, in a link, to one of my favorite quotes where it is, we do not need 
job creators. And for those that are creating jobs, they need as much support as possible. So I was running Detail Ignites close to seven, eight years, and we got to the point that we wanted to franchise our company and expand into the U.S. So I would go to other black focused business organizations. I remember going to the Jamaican consulate on Eglinton and be like, you know, I have a business. How can you help me? My parents are Jamaican. I'm here. Like, that's not what we do here. <laughs> I was like, what do you do here? We, we process passports. So I had to say to myself, this does not exist. And especially in Peel, there wasn't anything really specific. I brought seven other entrepreneurs together. We said, could we create an entity that would sit down with an entrepreneur, figure out what's, and then help them exponentially grow? Not just lifestyle where they're kind of going from week to week and hand to mouth, but having a business that becomes a machine that is an asset to their family that they can leave behind, start building generational wealth. And even to the community, I know my barber has no succession plan. So when he dies, the and he his kids don't want to take it over. And he's just like, I don't know what to do. So that conversation, I feel like we don't have enough. And with ACBN, the Afro-Caribbean Business Network, we're having that conversation a lot and really trying to get these companies from more when they're past ideation. I feel like BPA, the Black Business Professional Association, works better with entrepreneurs in ideation. Sheridan College and their EDGE program work really well with entrepreneurs in idea, ideation and getting traction. And then when you have those first sales, let's say $1,000 a month, and you want to get it over $15,000 a month, CBN, and we want to get you to IPO. So start dreaming big so that you can start hiring because your heart, I bet, is inclusive. So let's get you a business that's big enough to hire more people so they're not struggling to find a company that is inclusive. So well said. Oh, I love that. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, one more question here. Um, so Tanya, I know that you did uh, found Black H H H H R per professionals in in Cal of, of Canada Inc. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about that uh, group? Sure. So Black H R Professionals of Canada is a not for profit networking organization. Um, really, we, we exist to advance um, careers, to build, um, uh, to break barriers, and, and quite honestly, to help people to advance in their um, networks. But most importantly, um, I always sort of navigated the workplace being the only one. Um, and every workplace I've been at, I've been the, the first Black executive they ever had, right? Um, and it can be lonely, to be honest. And I and I knew there had to be other um, Black professionals in my field. And I just didn't know very many people. I mean, it's probably why I don't know Faith. And, and really, maybe her name looks a little familiar. Um, but we're so spread out and we may be in a, an organization and not know who's in the next organization. So after the death and the murders, rather, the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and Brianna, as well as George Floyd, I just thought, you know what, I've been in corporate for a long time and I am still in corporate. I'm the director of talent management for Ryerson University, but I thought to myself, I want to try to bring together other Black professionals so that we can support each other. We have some shared lived experience and maybe we just need to connect and find ways to um, figure out how we can become consultants, support each other's businesses, refer each other to jobs, hire each other, and really building up that, that community vibe. So um, I just decided to not basically sit on the sideline and wait for someone else to do it. Um, kind of like what you were saying, Ryan, where you sort of walked in and said, I'm here, I'm ready. I just said, you know what? Yes, I'm busy, but I'm always going to be busy. So let me start and see what I can do. And because starting is is better than never starting. Mm. So that's sort of the story. And, and that's what we do. Um, we have a lot of learning events, mentorship. Um, and and uh, we're looking at building a job board as well for all professions. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, 
that and I mean again again Donna, you're you're completely completely right. Slow motion is is better than than no motion in a, in a lot of senses. Um, that would you say that uh, networking is the biggest biggest barrier you've um, in, encountered? For me, it was certainly a barrier in the sense that I I guess I felt I was looking for that perfect mentor. I wanted the person to be black. I wanted them to be in HR. And I kept searching for this mentor without realizing that, wait a sec, my mentor doesn't have to be black, as well as my mentor doesn't have to be in HR. There could be aspects to their leadership that I can learn from. So I sort of had to, to learn that networking involves meeting many people certainly near and dear to my heart was the black community but i would say networking the the amount of people i've met in the last two years who i am inspired by and connect with now um i, I wish i figured that out earlier on not to go it alone wow beautifully said thank you thank you tanya yeah, it's so much better as a, you know, you, you walk hand in hand with another person rather than going alone. And I think tying that back in with our mental health conversation, it's so true. Just talking with somebody. I love that. And so for our, our last question we have for Ryan and Faith, you know, as our newest inductees to our business hall of fame, and most importantly, our first black inductees, what does that mean to you? And what does it mean to you to be a role model to Sheridan students and alumni? What's up there? Um, I can start. Uh, it's an honor. I mean, <laughs> it's, um, it's something that I, I will forever cherish. And um, it really is a true testament of, of Sheridan and the value that I got from the education um, I also sit on the professional advisory council, you know, for the degree programs um, since 2016. So it's an honor to be connected to such a great organization and then to be recognized in this way, um, you know, based on my contributions in, in business and, and, and life. Um, it, it truly is an art. It makes me feel really proud. Uh, to be the first, you know, like Tanya, in, in almost every role, every company, I've been the first manager, director, VP, or, you know, chief people officer, um, and be one of the only at the executive table. So to be the first for Sheridan, um, you know, in the, the Pilon School of Business Hall of Fame, um, it is definitely an honor. And um, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for others, and not just Black, but also you know, other people of color to see that, um, you know, Sheridan is a true ally and, um, you know, definitely a supporter of the community um, to, you know, basically show that anybody can, you know, strive to become a role model. Like we didn't apply for this. We didn't know we were going to get it. So at the end of the day, to be recognized in this way is is, is definitely an, an, an honor that I will forever cherish. Definitely a second that the, the Hall of Fame had a role to play in me even graduating. It took me 10 years to complete my three year diploma. And I remember when I went back because I had started my company, I was like, I need to finish this accounting just so I can use it for my business. And that auditing and taxation course was going to defeat me. And I would study at Davis campus in that Hall of Fame hallway. Say, if I ever want to be on this wall, I need to finish this class. And I'd be there till one and never really thinking that I would ever be on that wall. And I remember seeing it was quite a blizzard. It was like all white people. I was like, oh, it'd be, what if I was the first black man on this wall? So it was somewhere percolating in the back, but never really knew the process. So I was like, listen, I'm just gonna keep doing good. And it wasn't just about my business. It's about all the community work that I've been doing. And that's what I wanna be a role model to others coming through that just building a massive uh, capitalist business isn't what it's all about. It's about that social enterprise concept, that positive impact in the community, uh, eco-friendly impact in the community. So yeah, that's what we wanna instill through the ACBN and even through our company as well. So to mirror faith, I'm totally humbled and grateful 
and yeah, I, I'm proud to be on there and my children will be able to look up and see me one day when we go visit. Oh, if you're talking Sierra. Thank you so gonna... much. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll pass it back over to Angeline uh, just for the for the last bit. Thank you so much, guys. You are such an inspiration. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. Thank you, Tristan. You both rock. I said that before and I say it again. Thank you for great questions. Tanya, I know you have a hard stop, so we ask you one last question before you can jump out. Um, as a leader, tell us, how would you like to be remembered? And maybe your call to action. <laughs> I think um, I would like to be remembered as somebody who cared about the community, um, someone that my children can be very proud of. Um, while I might be the first in a lot of things, I want to know that I wasn't the last and that there's mm -hmm. going to be many, 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 many more after me. So I think those are the things that pop in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if we have time. Uh, Leslie, are you trying to jump in? I am. I am. For some reason, my video is not working, but please know I am smiling ear to ear right now <laughs> of this wonderful conversation. Yes, Nothing yes. Like <laughs> Nothing like technical, te technical difficulties, but oh, um, I'll just okay. quickly wrap it up for everyone. Um, so as Evangeline said, my name is Leslie Bean. I am the alumni manager here at Sheridan College. And just what an incredible night of meaningful conversation. Uh, conversations like the one we had tonight are so critical for all of us to learn and grow. Um, I'm a forever learner and I truly enjoy hearing from others and growing with others throughout the process. Um, Leadership is not just a title, it's the impact and influence you give to others within your school, your community, your social circles, or your place of work. And I think that was so evident through tonight's conversation. So thank you so much for highlighting that. Uh, Sheridan Student Leadership Framework is centered around personal growth, making a difference, uh, and working together. And it was so wonderful to hear from each of you how those three pillars are truly woven into your everyday life and how important they are to be a leader. Uh, leadership is a process and it's a choice. And I hope tonight's webinar has inspired everyone to take the next steps in their own leadership journey. Uh, someone in the chat tonight has already asked to connect with each of the panelists on LinkedIn, and that's a great first step in taking that initiative. So congrats to you. Um, a big thank you to our incredible shared alumni panelists, Ryan, Faith, and Tanya. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so proud to welcome you back to our virtual campus tonight. Uh, hopefully one day we can do this in person. Uh, we appreciate you sharing your own experiences, your personal stories, and offering advice to our, our, our larger community. I was making all kinds of notes about what you guys were discussing. It was disgusting. It was just great. Um, we truly do have the best alumni and we appreciate everything you guys do for us. Evangeline, we can't thank you enough for collaborating with Sheridan on so many of our initiatives, including tonight's event. We are so grateful to have your leadership, knowledge, and passion shine through to a, tonight's conversation. Uh, the theme for tonight was all about leadership, and you are such a fantastic example of what a true leader looks like. We are so grateful to have you as a partner and for me personally to continue to learn and grow from you. Tristan and Sierra are incredible student leaders. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, to help uh, you know, kick off the event and then help us with our Q&A. Um, you have such genuine enthusiasm and interest in this topic. So thank you so much for offering your own insights into it. Uh, your involvement with this event just makes it so much more important to us and interacting with so many people in the chat. Uh, as you said in your welcoming remarks that you are one of tomorrow's leaders and we can't wait to see what you guys do next. Uh, a big thank you to everyone at home who, to, who, home who to, turned in tonight. Uh, we are so grateful to have you part of our community and staying connected with us virtually. Be sure to visit uh, Sheridan Colleges or BMI's websites for future events like this, uh, the one that we had tonight. We'll be hosting our next series in February, so please stay tuned for more information about that. Or if you'd like to be a panelist member, please let us know. And again, feel free to connect with any of us on LinkedIn. Uh, we truly appreciate it. And just a big thank you to everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your night.
And thank you, Leslie, for all the work you've been doing. So we appreciate you. Thank yes. you, everybody. Good night. Take Good care. Night. Bye, everyone. Bye.